What we're going to do is we're going to focus on this tour, which was the big star yeah. show of 1962. Yeah. This happened 60 years ago this year, and it was a big old tour, wasn't it? It had Billy Fury, John yeah. Layton, Eden Kane, yeah. Joe Brown, the Viscounts, Ricky Stevens, the Carl Denver Trio, Shane Fenton and the Fentones, and of course you guys, Peter Jay and the Jay Walkers, yeah. and then every yeah. now and again, Marty Wilde would do some of the shows as well. What happened, we finished up, we backed John Layton, Marty we backed, and then later on we did about a year with him, sort of being his backing band. Great guy, fantastic guy to work for, he's amazing. He's my eldest son's godfather as well. And we sort of stayed sort of in touch all these years. Eden Kane, we backed him as well, and again, for a while we became his backing band. Did a sort of short tours with him. Jackie Linton we backed, Ricky Stevens, and then obviously we did our own act. So it was like fantastic value for Larry because... I seem to remember we used to open the show every time with Peter Gunn, the um, Dwayne Eddy sort of version, and then, then the acts would come on and we'd back them. And then obviously that to take us off probably after our act and then put chains, kit and drums and same for Billy. So I'm not, I can't remember the running order, but I just remember we used to always start with Peter Gunn. And funny enough, I had just recently, Dwayne Eddy came over to England, did a concert tour, and he actually played the Hippodrome for me, and uh, we met him, got on really well. He was a fabulous guy. And when he played Peter Gunn in there, my hair stood on end. It was just like going back in time. It was incredible, incredible. This particular tour, obviously, it's it's a Larry Pons tour. Tell us yeah. a little bit about Larry. Larry started off in the rag trade, and he then sort of got interested in the two eyes and what was happening there. And he basically discovered Tommy Steele in there and he was his manager. So that was sort of the sort of breakthrough really of British rock and roll. And then and then my dad got really sort of friendly with, with Larry and then Billy Fury came and did the season after the so he did one season with Tommy Steele sixty one and then in sixty two we did the season at the windmill with the Billy Fury um, Marty Wilde, Carl Denver, basically the same as this tour. Um, and then after that, we went, did other tours, but he, he was a, a, a character. He was very much in the sort of Brian Epstein kind of thing where he was sort of businessman who had done well and then latched on to this new pop phenomenon, which it was in those days. He got a stable of, of people together under him that, that he yeah. would give names to. and Yeah, he named them all. So I think Marty was the first one, and then you had sort of the Billy Fury and then the Vince Eagers, Johnny Gentle. There was a whole raft of them. It was really only Marty and Billy that made it really sort of made it work and, and had a great career from it. But it was um, at that stage, it, it was changing the names. I mean... Even uh, Georgie Fame, his real name is Clive Powell. He was doing a kind of Jerry Lee Lewis act, standing up with a sort of stripy jacket on, playing the piano, <laughs> with it, with his name change, which obviously wasn't him. Eventually, because he he backed Billy Fury on the first tour, because uh, we were on the coach with all of them, and then something happened and they they left, and that's when they started doing the rhythm blues thing, and then he got the hit records and did the Flamingo. Path, of course, was to change your name. You never changed your name, though, did you? No, we no. didn't. We, well, it was a funny thing. When, our, when we first started in Norwich, we were going to be called The Jay Hawkers, because it was a, an old Western film of about that we all like, The Jay Hawkers. I've got the poster now um, from it, but the first gig we did, they put Peter Jay and The Jay Walkers. So that stuck. Oh, well, that sounds all right. It's fine. So we spent the next 10 years trying to get arrested for being jaywalking, but we never managed to do it. But it, it, it worked well, and it was a sort of odd setup because the concept was we had two of everything. So we had two saxes, two bass players, two guitars, and I had the double bass drum setup. So that was kind of weird, kind of, and we were only going to do instrumentals. And so that's how we did um, our first record. We were signed to Decca just after that season. And then we did Can Can, which was was a pretty big hit. It sold a hundred thousand copies, but not 
If we'd done that in one week, we'd have gone to number one, but it, it got to about 19 in one chart and about 30-something in one of the other charts. But what was happening, as we were going around the country on these mega tours, as, as we left the town, the sales would bump up. Uh, it, was a, it was a very strong act. Basically, all the boys did the sort of can-can and jumping about. Cause in those days, everybody did foot movements. It was prior to the sort of Beatles and Stones and everybody, but everybody did. And we sort of went one stage further where they were not just doing the sort of shadows walk, they were doing the can-can. And, and we used to do William Tell Overture. That was the other big one that was not ours, but we used to do, and they used to run up and down all the time. But we re- used to rehearse in a windmill theatre in the winter, which was so cold that um, a few times that they were running up and down the spot playing, and I was out in the audience, I said, oh, wow, that looks great. We'll keep that in. Because it's, it's easy for me because I'm just sitting on the drum kit. <laughs> but that was my first sort of real entrance into sort of producing shows, which I've done ever since. But the other thing I was going to say to you was the, the amazing thing about this tour, so all together, because these were all twice nightly, so we did 86 shows, or almost on the bounce, you know. Larry Parnes was working you hard, wasn't he? I suppose it was easy for him. He was just sort of picking the dates out of the, out of the thing. And, and when you look round, look at them, some of the journeys were, it wasn't worked out on the kind of logistics. It was just sort of as they came in, I think. And we, what used to happen was we had to get the coach every morning. There's a little street behind Madame Tussauds where he used to pick us all up. Well, actually, on all the tours we did, and it was eight o'clock in the morning uh, to get get on the coach, and then we would drive all day, say to you know Stoke or wherever we we're going, Halifax, do the two shows, and pack up, and then the coach would come back to London, and then the next day it was eight o'clock again. It was amazing, really. But we didn't get ill because I, I never missed in, in the ten years we were on the road. I never missed one gig, but we by the end of this tour, I remember feeling. Oh my God! I feel none of us were oh well, you know. We were just hanging on when we got to the end. So we, at Plymouth, I got in the. Uh, we had our van there. We were just picking our, all our gear up and uh, loaded it up and um, said, "Right, we're going back to Yarmouth and we're going to have a few days off." And I got just outside, and we ran out of petrol. <laughs> we'd, we'd forgot uh, just outside Plymouth. We were planning on this big trip back home and you know, we had to walk miles to get cans of petrol and oh, it was a nightmare oh my goodness so so let's get this straight then so you would basically you'd be picked up at eight o'clock in the morning from london you would draw in this coach in the coach, coach Tim, timpson coach yeah. right so everybody would get on um i think probably i don't think joe used to get on there or billy they probably had cars everybody else um i'm not sure about john Leighton or Marty, but everywhere else used to get on, and then uh, you travel all day. And don't forget, the other interesting thing is the only bit of the motorway that was open was a small stretch just uh, at the top there where the Blue Boar is. It took forever to go to these places. You know, you went to, to the left at the top there, and you had to go down, I think it was the A5 or something. But the Blue Ball was the saviour. You know, when we, when we got to the Blue Ball, everybody used to use that. You could go in there and see basically everybody in, in the rock and roll business would be in there. It was quite amazing. She just, whoever had it should have kept an autograph book. It was amazing. Uh, our guitarist was a um, Chuck Berry nut, Casey. He'd learned every Chuck Berry solo, including all the mistakes. <laughs> he had them off. All the, we walked in there and... Uh, He'd turn around, he, he had a plate of beans and chips or whatever, and Chuck Berry was sitting there, and he dropped them all on the floor. <laughs> he, was like, he, was, he couldn't believe it, you know, being in England. He, he came over a couple of times. The Blue Ball was the place. So for the Mansfield gig, so to speak, you would get up in the morning, meet in London, go to Mansfield, do two gigs, and then go all the way back to London. I don't remember ever staying in a, you know, or being given a hotel to stay in. I just saying, what? What was the one after that one? Um, um, Grantham. Mansfield, Granada, then Grantham, which is relatively close. You would have thought... It was you... close, but I don't remember any time them providing a hotel or anything. So we either came back or we all had to find our own kind of 
whatever level we were at, we were sort of down towards the bottom, find, find your own digs to stay in. The other thing, this will make you laugh. So we, we're back in half the show, we're doing our own act and paying for any digs we had to do if we did have to stay somewhere. And the, the, the actual salary was £20 a week. It was sort of par for the course. If you were an up-and-coming band and you just signed a contract, if you got 20 a week, that was sort of fairly good money. But the time you'd sort of eat, that was it. You know, and it was like that for years. So Larry yeah. must have done very well out of it. And the other interesting thing is that we didn't carry a, a sound system with us. So basically, the back line amps were as they were, but all the vocals came through the house PA. And most of these places were mainly cinemas um, with no big house PA at all. It must have been impossible to hear anything out front. It was the same on the Beatles, though. We, we didn't carry a sound system with us or a mixing desk or anything. And uh, later on in 67, I think, when we did a tour with the Beach Boys when they came over, it was the first time I'd ever seen a mixing desk out front. And that was only in the orchestra pit, which wasn't, wasn't much good. So the, the sound for all those shows must have been horrendous. It was like, you, you know, with the screaming that was going on, you couldn't have heard much, I don't think, yeah. out front. We backstage, they needed a lot of them these big old theatres and, and cinemas that had a, a fold-back system, so you could hear it better backstage, what was coming through the mics, than you could from out front, which is it, it, it's quite amazing. I, looking back on it, they couldn't have heard anything. Anything, it was impossible. I know that Mansfield obviously was a cinema, the Granada. It was never built as a place where there were going to be gigs. They all had a sort of sound, sort of, a couple of old sort of fashioned column speakers probably there, you know. The stage at Mansell was quite small, wasn't very deep, so there wasn't no. a lot of room for the performers sometimes at no. these places. No. So um, th this is probably, the only time they probably changed was when they changed the drum kits over for, you see, probably Carl Denver hasn't got a drummer, so he could probably work in front of the tabs, and then, say, Shane could be setting up behind, and then the, somebody else needs to do something whilst sort of Joe Brown sets his stuff up. Or sometimes we used to all be allowed to put our drum kits on and leave them on all the time. You know, it used to be not very well produced at all. And I'll tell you a funny story that happened to me at Liverpool. When I got there to the Empire, they built me, because I'd done it before, they built me a great big rostrum about 10 or 15 foot high at the back. And I, I, I don't, didn't like being at the back because I, I always featured myself at the front. It was a sort of strange setup. This is before Dave Clark went in, but I was at the front with, with, with the boys. And I thought, well, I'd better use this rostrum. So at the end of our act, we played Can Can, did a big drum solo. And the main thing was, I grilled all the people, on the, they had two spotlights and stage lights. So I would do a big drum solo with just two spots on. And then when I, I used to go crazy and then make out a pass out over the drums. So I said, when I pass out over the drums, you go off and it's complete blackness. Whatever happens, I don't want this to, anything to come on. And then I used to hit one bass drum, it lit up. The next bass drum in the back, I used to get fantastic reaction. And then all the drums uh, building up and uh, sparks coming out of cymbals and everything. And the, the lights would come on again, and that would be the end. It's quite strong. So I got on the Liverpool, got on the um, rostrum, and as I did the collapse on the drums, I fell off the back of the rostrum. So I was actually, I didn't hurt myself, but I was in total blackness, and I'd spent about half an hour sort of threatening anybody to put a light on until my <laughs> bass drums lit up. I was going to go mad. So I had to clamber climb up the back it must have been two to three minutes get back up there and and hit, hit them and then it all it all went off okay but it was like at that moment i was scrabbling around the back of this rostrum it all covered in black tabs and uh, they're not going to do anything so I could get back on the drums again it was really it was amazing you said you were very friendly with shane fenton and the fentones obviously the mansfield act they were a pretty tight band weren't they oh they're fantastic and when we were doing the sort of one-off clubs, round the clubs and everything, they were always, 
sort of one in front of us or one behind us. And I'll, I'll never forget one um, one poster I saw coming next week. Um, Shane Fenton and the Fentones, and this is how everybody's mind worked with equipment equal to the shadows. In fact, they had those three amps on the chrome stands and the guitars. Everybody was obsessed with the sort of shadows. It was unbelievable. We were great mates. He was great. And then because when he morphed into Alvin, his manager lived not far from us in in London, back in the same street. So we, we weren't there at the time. So Alvin, Shelvin, we used to call Alvin, um, so he, he, I lent him my flat. So he actually stayed in my flat whilst he did um, all the bits and pieces for my Kuvichu. And then he said to me, "Oh, would you like to come on top of the pops with me and and, and mine? Because it was all mine, you know." And uh, I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'll come and mine the drum." He said, "The only trouble is we've got a drummer. You'll have to mine the bass." <laughs> I said, "I'm not going to do that. I can't. Everybody knows I'm a drummer. They can't." So I wasn't on it. Otherwise, I would have been on it. He was a fabulous guy, a lovely guy. He was amazing, amazing. It was great. I think what people don't realise is early on, this is 61, 62, there weren't that many groups about. It wasn't a group thing. And us and James Benton, and there was like The Undertakers, the Flea Wreckers, who were an instrumental group. And there was uh, Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Browsers. There wasn't that many groups. There was sort of professionally, and then all the others were local groups. The package show thing is just crazy, isn't it? I mean, you got a lot of bang for your buck, didn't you? You got to see a lot of acts. It's amazing because it, I mean, a lot of these acts at that stage had records in the top, you know, top twenty, and you got about four or five of them for next to nothing. You know, it's incredible. But it obviously worked. I don't. I don't know what Larry was paying all the others. So you all got on. I mean, there was no. There was no massive egos there. No, no, it wasn't. It wasn't like that. Billy was the only one who was quite hard to get friendly with. And it's not till later I, I, you know, obviously found out he hadn't been well a lot of the time. Some days he used to be really talkative, and the other days he was always sort of in a, a sort of dream world. And because we did two or three tours with him, and the summer season, and uh, it, it was because he wasn't wasn't that well. But I mean, he was the most amazing performer. I can't tell you. I mean, it was like wow, you know, incredible. And so when he had Georgie Fame backing him, that band was amazing. I mean, it was a lot better than I thought it was with the Tornadoes. The main thing with the, those shows early was just the stars themselves just getting in and out of the theatre in one piece. I can't tell you, it was like dangerous, you know, because if somebody jumps on you and you fall down and everybody else piles on top and it's kind of not very good. 